Hi everybody, this is Julian from Hugging Face. In previous videos, we looked at different techniques to optimize and accelerate large language models, like uh, attention layers and model compilation and hardware acceleration. And in this video, we're going to look at a very important technique called model quantization, which is critical in shrinking and accelerating large models. In fact, I'm going to do two videos because there is a ton of material to cover. So in this first video, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce what quantization is. I'm going to try and give you an intuition of how it works. And we're going to start exploring the different types of quantization, post-training, uh, static or dynamic, quantization-aware training. And we'll start looking at some of the algos that are available out there and how they work with transformers. And in part two, uh, I'll keep exploring more algos, including the latest and greatest bleeding edge techniques. Okay, so if you're interested in quantization, you definitely do not want to miss those two videos. Okay, let's get started. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to enable notifications so that you won't miss future videos. Also, why not share this video on your social networks or with your colleagues? Because if you found this useful, others may find it useful too. Thank you very much for your support. As their name implies, large language models are large. And uh, there's always the need to shrink them, to help them fit into uh, less memory. And there's always the need to accelerate them and particularly accelerate inference. And in past videos, I've covered different techniques like new attention layers, faster attention layers, hardware acceleration, uh, model compilation. And so today we're going to focus on another framework level feature. Uh, and of course, I mean quantization. So first of all, let's define what quantization is. As we all know, Model weights, model parameters are learned during training or fine tuning, and they're stored as numerical values. Now, the common data types for those numerical values are uh, typically floating point formats. So floating point 32, uh, so 32 bits, four bytes, or uh, FP16, uh, floating point 16, 16 bit, two bytes, and uh, a more uh, accurate variant uh, that doesn't overflow <laughs> called BF16, which is still 16-bit. Um, and we won't go too deep into numerical formats, but typically that's FP32. So a number of bits are uh, used for um, the actual fraction, or the actual representation of the number. Um, uh, some bits are used for the exponent and there's a sign bit as well, okay? and well, the formats are, obviously, they have different length and they use a different number of bits for different things, but generally that's the idea, right? Doesn't matter so much, but hey, that's FP32 to you and me. Obviously, the larger the data type we use to, uh, to store model parameters, the finer the granularity, right? Um, the more precisely we can store and represent um, two values that are just a little bit different, right? If we have more bits, then we can be more precise. And obviously that helps the models be more accurate. Well, nothing's free as we know, and the, the cost of this increased precision is of course, we need more memory to store the, the model parameters, so the model itself. Um, and that means uh, we'll also need more memory bandwidth to um, you know, read and write um, those, um, those model weights and model parameters uh, from the GPU to the, to the, the memory uh, where, where they're stored. And we covered this problem, I guess, when we discussed uh, the attention layers, flash attention, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, also, the larger the models, um, the wider the model parameters, the more compute we're going to need, right? And of course, inference will be slower. So if models have a reasonable size, that's no big deal. But again, uh, large models are getting larger and larger. And so as we add more parameters, 
as we increase sequence length and as we increase the dimension of bending of embeddings etc cetera, etc cetera, um, things kind of slow down to to a crawl and so the purpose of quantization is to shrink the model by rescaling the weights from the full precision or high precision format to a shorter format so literally use fewer bits to store those parameters and so by doing that of course we reduce the amount of memory that's required to store the model we reduce the pressure on uh, memory accesses between the gpu and the, uh, the 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 memory where everything's stored and um, we reduce the compute requirements because if we need to do let's say 8-bit arithmetic um, this should be quite faster than 32-bit uh, arithmetic and of course we want to do all of this uh, with minimal loss of accuracy if any so what formats uh, are typically seen in quantization um, well they're typically integer formats so int 8 8-bit or int 4 4-bit and as we'll see newer techniques can even go down to uh, less than 4 bits which is pretty crazy right so that's the name of the game. Uh, start from a model that's been trained in 32-bit uh, mode or 16-bit mode and automatically rescale its parameters to 8-bit or even less. So the, the big question, of course, is how do we do that, right? How do we map the values living in that, um, let's say, 32-bit space into uh, an 8-bit space, right? So just to give you a, a sense of what we're trying to do, so imagine we have uh, uh, values living, you know, from the smallest value you can represent with uh, floating point 32 all the way to the largest value that we can represent with FP32. And um, imagine we have to uh, rescale them to um, the smallest value you can represent with eight integer bits and um, the largest value you can represent with int eight. Right? So, well, you need to cram all those high precision values into a much smaller range. And now, uh, as we will see, there are different ways to do this. And uh, the more clever we get, um, the, the less accuracy we're going to lose, right? So I'm showing one dimension here. I'm showing just one line. But keep in mind, uh, when we work with LLMs, we're working with uh, weight tensors. And uh, obviously they have more than one dimension. So what we need to do is really rescale weights and activations possibly across all tensor dimensions, but that's crazy uh, to uh, uh, draw and I guess to imagine. So we'll stick to one line. So let's dive into how we actually rescale values. And we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna start simple. So in order to, to do this, um, we need a mapping function. So the mapping function is a, a math function um, where we're going to input the high precision um, parameters and it's going to output the lower precision parameters, okay? By default, uh, you're going to do this per layer. Uh, we'll see later that not all layers have the same uh, weight distributions. Um, so per layer is generally how we do this. We can also be more granular and we'll see some of the algos use um, per row or per column um, uh, quantization. And, uh, and when I mean row or column, I mean uh, with respect to the weight tensors, obviously. So apologies for the, the math. Uh, I, I worked very, very, very hard to have zero math uh, in all my presentations, but I guess uh, I couldn't do without it here. But don't worry, don't run away. Uh, don't go watch silly cat and dog videos, stick with me. Um, this is math everybody can understand. So first of all, we need uh, a function, right? Uh, the mapping function. And the function is very, I guess, is, is very simple. So we're going to compute the ratio between R, which is our high precision value, uh, and a scaling factor, okay? So resizing um, that high precision value 
to, um, uh, I guess, a lower precision value. And we add uh, um, a bias factor. We'll, we'll see w w why we need that. And uh, we round that value, um, especially for integers, right? So we take the uh, high precision input divided by a scaling factor um, at a bias and round things, okay? So that's, that's a very, very simple math. And um, the scaling factor, as you could imagine, is just the ratio between the two bounds of the input range and the two bounds of the output range, okay? So if we go, um, let's say in the simplest um, uh, scenario, if we rescale from uh, FP32 to, uh, to int 8, um, then um, alpha beta would be uh, uh, min uh, FP32 max FP32, and uh, alpha Q and beta Q would be uh, min int 8 max in eight okay so again that's the kind of the naive way to to see it so we are literally rescaling um the, the from the high precision range to the other range right no big deal and uh that z parameter is just a bias value to make sure uh, the zeros match okay so a zero in the high precision range uh, becomes a zero in the low precision range okay don't worry too much about the about the details you you can check that this actually works okay so the the, the key thing here is we need um to find ranges um and uh and compute the ratio between them and rescale okay so that's not too difficult the question of course is um how do we pick uh, the alpha and beta range, okay? Alpha Q and beta Q are kind of figured out. If we use eight bits um, for quantization, then we have eight bits, <laughs> right? So we go from uh, minus uh, 128 to plus uh, 127, I guess. So, okay, well, that's, that's what we have. Um, but the input range is where we can tweak and and you'll see why in a second so here's an example and for reference i i did show you the the max the mean and max values we can represent with uh, fp32 and uh, and int 8 and um and bf16 too so bf16 has obviously fewer bits than fp32 but it has the same range so less granularity but the same range right that's not a typo there Okay, so, so at the top we see, uh, again, uh, the numerical range from min FP32 to max FP32, okay, and we have some values in there. And at the bottom we see min int 8, max in 8, and those represent alpha Q and beta Q. So one way to do it would be to say, well, I don't need to represent... Um, um, values that are lower than the smallest value on the, on the input range, and I don't need to represent um, values that are higher than the largest value in the input range. So why don't I take uh, as my input range uh, alpha as the smallest input value available and beta as the highest value? And we just map those to alpha Q and beta Q and rescale everything in between, All right? So that's perfectly reasonable. And that's a simple way to do it. The problem is um, this is very sensitive to outliers. And we can see, for example, alpha here is quite low, right? Uh, and there's a big gap between alpha and the next value. And there's quite a gap between beta and its neighbor and, and the more... Uh, uh, central values here. So the problem here is um, we're wasting a lot of space, uh, a lot of numerical space uh, in the quantized range. And so that means the value in the middle, so to speak, are squeezed. And we don't have a lot of bits, right, in the quantized range. So the more we squeeze stuff in the middle, 
Well, um, the less granularity we'll have, and you know, there could be even the uh, a problem where uh, different values in the input range get mapped to identical values in the quantized range because we simply do not have enough granularity to replace them, to represent them. Okay, uh, so that's the problem we have, uh, and so of course we'll try and minimize the that uh, wasted numerical space. Uh, there are alternatives. Um, if you look at the PyTorch documentation, you'll see um, uh, options to use uh, percentiles uh, or histogram bins, and, and both are really trying to do the same thing, which is instead of looking at individual values, build you know, buckets and try to group uh, weights that are really, really close to one another. And, and, you know, try to pack things a little bit uh, and, and not waste too much space. But generally, um, this, is, this is problematic. And as we'll see later, the larger the, the, the LLM, um, the, the, the more outliers we have and, well, the, the, the worse uh, this is going to perform. So what else can we do? Well, of course... Um, we need, or we could, I guess, uh, get rid of outliers. So we could decide that those, uh, you know, extreme left and extreme right values in the input range are outliers and they're undesirable. And so we'll pick alpha or beta and beta as, uh, I would say, more uh, central values, right? So the benefit is obviously... Uh, we don't waste as much space in the quantized range. Then we also see the quantized values are nicely uh, uh, spread apart, right? So there are still different values. Of course, the problem is we did drop some some values out there, right? And um, and the question is how many outliers can we eliminate without hurting accuracy too much, right? So. Um, because all those outliers on the left will be mapped to uh, to uh, alpha Q, and all those outliers on the right will be mapped to beta Q. So if we have too many of those, we're kind of you know truncating <laughs> uh, the input range at both uh, ends. And well, there's got to be there's got to be a, a threshold where if we do this too much, accuracy uh, starts to be awful. Okay. So the goal is really uh, we want to minimize information loss between the, the input uh, distribution of weights and the quantized distribution, okay? Again, I'm showing this as a line, but imagine a, imagine a nice uh, statistical distribution. We want the two to be as closely related, quote-unquote, as possible. So um, the only way to minimize this is to try different things, right? Try different thresholds, you know, slide alpha left and right, slide beta left and right, you know, again, that's just one dimension, and see how close we can get um, uh, the, um, the two distributions, right? Um, so in order to do all those tries, of course, we need to predict um, a data set Right? That's the only way we can, we can observe what happens when we move the thresholds. So we'll need a calibration data set. And there's a, a, very, a very nice and complicated algorithm uh, to measure the, the difference between two statistical distribution. It's called the Kullback Leibler divergence. Yes, that's horrible. Uh, or KL divergence. Okay, so that's the basic ID run many attempts with the calibration data set, observe the quantized distribution uh, with different thresholds, and pick the thresholds that minimize the difference between the two uh, distributions as shown by the KL divergence, okay? So these are some of the, I would say, popular techniques, um, and, um, and we'll see more. But that's the basic intuition of uh, what we're trying to do. Okay, so before we start diving into the actual um, quantization um, libraries and algorithms, um, we need to discuss a very important topic, which is when can we apply quantization? The simplest way to do it 
is to take a model that has already been trained and quantize its weight. Okay, um, so this is called post-training quantization. Um, and we'll see there are two different flavors. There's the post-training dynamic quantization and post-training static quantization. So let's see what the difference is. So we're doing this post-training. So we load a trained model, right? So you train your model, you have that, you load it, and um, you convert the model weights, okay? So you apply your quantization algorithm, your rescaling, as we, as we quickly discussed. And so, well, you do that once, obviously, right? Weights need to be quantized only once, and you can save them and reload them and reuse them all the time. Um, when it comes to activations, of course, activation values will be different from one data sample or even one data set to the next, right? So you will actually do the quantization of activations on the fly, right? Um, just before running the computation. So the, the benefit here is, um, this is very simple. Uh, we just load the model and quantize it. Um, this is very flexible because from one data set to the next, um, you will rescale activations in a, in a different way. The problem is you are doing this dynamically, right? Uh, you are computing uh, the quantized activations dynamically. So there is a bit of overhead, right? Those models tend to be a little slower. So the, the other technique is called static quantization. Starts the same, okay? We load the model, uh, we convert the weights, okay? And then we use a calibration data set. We observe the distribution of activations, and then we set the scaling factor for activations, um, again, to minimize uh, the, the difference between the two distributions uh, as we discussed before, okay? And um, and and then we we you know we freeze everything. The benefit obviously is we do everything once ahead of time, uh, and so there is no overhead when we predict everything has already been quantized. Uh, the problem is potentially that calibration is pretty dependent on the data set. So if you calibrate with a data set and then predict another data set. Um, if it's very close statistically, then fine, it will work. If the data set is a bit different, um, your accuracy may not be as good. So, so I'm not saying you need to have um, a different model for each data set. That would be maybe a little extreme, but um, you need to take care of that. You need to, to be mindful of the, the potential uh, accuracy um, shift, uh, degradation that, uh, that could happen if you use data sets are a little bit different. And then there's the third technique, which is completely different, which is called quantization aware training. So as the name implies, we will train the model and apply quantization during training, which is very different from the two previous techniques. So we train at full precision. Okay. So let's say FP32 or FP16. And in in the training process, we apply quantization um, kind of in parallel, right? So we keep all the full precision values, but we also quantize them to observe um, the distribution and, and set the right scaling factors that will give us maximum accuracy. So all those two, those two things kind of happen in parallel. Um, and of course, this will give us higher quality models uh, because we we quantize um, again and again and again based on the iterative training process. So we just have more chances to to um, to minimize uh, prediction error. The, the the big problem, of course, is we need to train or potential or retrain if we have an existing model. So if you have a smaller model, that's okay. Um, you know, if it trains for a few hours, maybe it's worth doing uh, quantization aware training. But if you need to retrain, uh, you know, your 70 billion parameter model or your 150 billion parameter model, well, maybe that's too expensive for you, right? So um, for LLMs, uh, post-training quantization 
is generally uh, is generally the preferred option. And quantization aware training is for even I would say non transformer models. Uh, maybe you know uh, uh, CNNs for computer vision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, one quick note: obviously, when we predict with the models, uh, we we don't want to output integers, right? Uh, we want to output the original data type. So even though quantized model will work with uh, quantized values, just before outputting the value, the final prediction, uh, there is a dequantization process to return uh, either, let's say, an FP16 or an FP32 value, because that's what your, I guess, your code expects, right? Um, and the dequantization is just a reverse operation from quantization. So mapping the small range value back to the to the large range value. Okay. All right. Uh, enough theory for now. Uh, let's look at a quick example. And I guess this is really the maybe the simplest possible example I could find. So. PyTorch actually includes a um, quantization uh, module. Load a model, uh, good old Bert, and just apply torch quantization, quantize dynamic, right? Which is, the, again, the simplest way to do it. Uh, quantize the weights. Uh, we don't need a, a calibration data set. So we just pass the original model. Um, we decide to quantize all the linear layers in BERT, which is where the, the vast majority of uh, parameters live. So probably that's where we'll get a uh, bang for our buck. And we decide to quantize to 8 bits. Okay. So I actually ran this uh, on, a, on an EC2 instance, on a CPU instance. Uh, and... I got a I got a model reduction of fifty eight percent, right? Uh, this took just uh, you know seconds, right? This was a very very fast process, and inference latency, um, measuring in a very naive way, you know, just one thread, just uh, uh, batch size uh, one, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, was uh, inference was reduced thirty one percent. Okay, and of course you could do better if. If you had uh, multiple threads, larger batch sizes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and um, and the the accuracy degradation is under one percent for uh, MRPC, which is a sentence uh, similarity task, right? Uh, you can find more uh, more information in the blog post uh, reference here. So just just this, right? Just that one line of code shrinks the model uh, over two x. And gives you, um, you know, maybe 31% out of the box, and certainly way more if you use a, a proper inference server. And of course, if you print out the the model, you'll see exactly what you did, right? Uh, you'll see the uh, the linear layers have been uh, have been replaced by their quantized equivalent, which is called dynamic quantized linear, right? And we can see the the data type is indeed int8 for this, okay? So exactly what you uh, think it is. So that's a good way to get started. Um, but of course, over time, um, a number of different algos and, uh, and techniques have been introduced. So let's walk through those different techniques. We'll see how they improve on one another. So the first one that I thought was interesting is called zero quant. And this might be the first uh, quantization technique optimized for LLMs. Quantization has been around for, for a long time. Um, but as we'll see, typical quantization techniques tend to break for large models. And I think zero quant was kind of the first to realize this and, um, and propose solutions. But, you know, I may be wrong on this. So zero quant is dynamic post-training quantization. Okay, so uh, no, no calibration data set needed. Uh, it can do uh, int 8 weights and activations or int 4 weights in int 8 activations. A very interesting thing that the, the paper highlights is that weight ranges are very different across layers uh, in an LLM, and activation ranges are even more uh, different, right? And we see this on, uh, on this graph. So on the left, 
you see um, the box plots for the activation ranges. So the x-axis is um, the layer numbers and the y-axis is just the, the box plot, right? So uh, the range and the, the median, etc., etc. And And we see... Um, if you look at the you know if you look at the medians i mean that's not a straight line at all right there there's a, a really big difference between the 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 box plot on let's say layer 2 layer 3 and then layer 22 23 right the 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 magnitude here is uh is quite different uh we also see on all layers we have tons of outliers right um and and that's that's always a problem on the right, uh, we see the, um, the weight ranges for the attention layers, okay? And here we see, the again, the box plots are much more aligned. Uh, so there is definitely less variability here, although we still see a lot of outliers. But the box plots are kind of almost aligned, you know? And so that means the median and uh, I guess the, 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 the center uh, the center of the distribution is kind of similar. Um, and that's a theme we'll see. Activations are definitely wilder and, and more difficult to quantize. So the, the way ZeroQuant decides to, to deal with this is that instead of trying to quantize weights with um, you know, a single scaling factor, it's going to apply a technique called group-wise quantization. So that means the weight answers are going to be grouped, right? Um, by, uh, I guess, similar properties, and they're gonna be quantized separately, right? So if we see um, some layers with, you know, I would say narrower ranges and, and not so many outliers, then maybe we group them and, and quantize them. And if we see some layers we have a um, pretty extreme range of values, then uh, we can quantize them separately. And so uh, we can find the right scaling factor uh, for, for each group, okay? They also use a technical token-wise uh, quantization or activations. And as the name implies, um, they will dynamically, okay, so at inference time, compute the min-max range for each token, right? So as we um, as we decode each token uh, through the LLM, uh, we dynamically compute the range of activations that's required, okay? Uh, optionally, they add a distillation process, uh, but I, I won't go uh, I won't go into that. What's also interesting is they obviously focus on optimizing that process for hardware uh, efficiency um, because those algorithms are uh, not always very easy to implement on, on GPU, to say the least. So they, they focus on uh, building very, very fast implementations. So if we look at the benchmark, um, so the blue box is uh, the baseline. So W16A16 means 16-bit uh, weights and 16-bit activations, right? And we see different benchmarks from, um, I would say, uh, uh, classification to generation, etc. And the green box is, uh, so W8A8, so 8-bit weights, 8-bit activations with zero quant. And we see we're doing quite okay um we're doing quite okay so we shrink the model quite a lot right because we go from 16-bit everything to 8-bit everything so that's nice and we see the benchmarks are um are extremely close to the baseline so they report the numbers for BERT and uh, they they see 2x to 5x speed up and um and again for w8a8 um accuracy is uh, almost identical so when we try to apply stronger quantization, uh, four bit uh, weights or eight bit um, activations, then the benchmarks start to uh, start to suffer a lot, right? So that's kind of the limit for uh, for zero quant. But you know, at, at least zero quant showed uh, there was a lot of variability in, in in weights and activations. It did propose some good solutions, and it was a good first step 
for, uh, I guess, 8-bit quantization. The next technique uh, is called bits and bytes, uh, came um, a few months later. Again, it's dynamic post-training quantization uh, for 8-bit um, and 4-bit quantization of weights. And it also introduces 8-bit optimizers so that uh, we can actually train with 8-bit uh, integer optimizer values instead of using full precision values. And here, obviously, this lets us uh, save a lot of GPU memory during the training process. So this lets us train larger models that normally wouldn't fit on this GPU. So all LLMs will have outliers, uh, and the bigger they are, um, the more outliers they'll have. So that's really, uh, that's a given. But those outliers will be restricted to a smaller number of dimensions. And so there's probably an opportunity to optimize for this, right? Bits and bytes is a really interesting technique. You can see the, the high level uh, benchmark here. Uh, the, uh, the green line is the, the, the um, FP16 uh, baseline. The, um, the brownish line is just um, the vanilla 8-bit quantization baseline. And we see how badly it breaks when the model starts to, uh, to have more than, let's say, 3 billion parameters. Um, and the blue line um, is the, uh, the bits and bytes quantization. So bits and bytes quantizes efficiently even the largest models. So they do this through a number of techniques like vector-wise quantization. Vector here refers to the vector dot products involved when we multiply inputs and weight tensors, right? So matrix multiplication is just uh, a series of uh, uh, vector dot products and they apply different scaling factors for those dot products, okay? Not just one scaling factor for the, the full multiplication. And because those outliers only live in certain dimensions, those dimensions are quantized differently, okay? Because we need a different range. Uh, we have, I would say, more extreme values to quantize and they use a technical mixed precision decomposition, which is using 16-bit values. So I guess that gives them more, uh, more space to represent those values. And then they reconcile everything, right? So the huge majority of weights are quantized um, with vector-wise quantization, um, 99 plus, maybe even more percent. And then just a tiny number of outliers in very specific dimensions are processed with 16-bit, okay? So best of both worlds. Good compression for most of the parameters and better precision for the troublemakers, okay? So when you use 8-bit quantization, you get about 2x memory savings. Accuracy is on par with FP16. And speed, as we'll see, is hit and miss. So if we look at precision first, uh, you see the blue uh, highlight here is the FP32 baseline, and the green highlight is um, uh, bits and bytes. Uh, and we see we're even doing better in a way. <laughs> we're even we're either super close to the FP32 baseline or exceeding it. Okay, so that's very very good because we we don't lose any accuracy. Uh, we save uh, 2x memory, and that's nice. And if we work with the larger LLMs, and as you can see, you know, I would say 13 billion parameters and above, we actually get a speed up, as you can see here. Uh, for that uh, uh, 13 billion parameter model, we get 1.22x um, speed up, and for the largest one, 175 billion, we get 1.81 uh, speed up, right? Um, for the smaller models, uh, we're actually slower. And the reason why we see those, um, I would say, different degrees of speed up is because that mixed precision decomposition algorithm is difficult to implement efficiently. Uh, and so, you know, there's, a, there's the tax you need to pay. And for smaller models, it's just not worth it. 
So bits and bytes is very nicely integrated in hugging face libraries, uh, transformers, etc., etc., etc. And it couldn't be simpler to use. This is really what it takes. That one line, just use the transformers library and just set that load in 8-bit or load in 4-bit parameter to true. And that's all there is to it. Okay, that's the end of part one. That's already quite a mouthful. So uh, go and digest all of it, uh, read the papers. And when you're ready for part two, uh, you know where to find it. And we'll talk about GPTQ, AWQ, uh, HQQ, uh, smooth quant, which are all uh, very interesting quantization techniques. Okay, until next time, keep rocking.